Sarah has selected a, she's here with her, her, um, her new film, um, Boom For Real, um, the late teenage years of John Michel Basquiat, and also presenting a carte blanche of films that she's selected. Um, and we thought a good way to start would be, since not everybody here has seen the film, maybe to start with um, a clip. Um, do you want to set it up for us? <laughs> this is a, a clip uh, from the film that uh, features Alexis Adler, who's in the audience. And, um, and she's actually the reason why the, I made the documentary. Um, I went to her house, Hurricane Sandy hit the Lower East Side in New York and flooded that whole area of New York. And Alexis had lived with Jean-Michel Basquiat, 79, 80. And we all knew she lived with her. She had a mural on her bedroom wall. She had, her bathroom door was painted. But after the hurricane, she went and to her lockbox where she had kept uh, the artwork that he had left at her house after he moved out. And she found over 60 pieces of writings, drawings, a notebook of his. Um, she also realized, remembered she had a box of clothes he had painted on. And when I saw everything that she had, I think I was one of the first people to see everything. Um, I was like, Alexis, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> you don't have gates on your windows or anything. You have no protection. And I said, and but when I saw it, I thought, oh my God, this is a window into who, how he started as an artist. Alexis gave him a place that was safe, where he could paint the walls, the floor, he could experiment, and it, he had run away from home when he was 16, and um, and it was really he had been sleeping on people's couches and floors and things like that, but. He, he lived for a period of months at Alexis's and started really finding his way as an artist there. And very few people realize also that he was a pretty amazing poet at the age of 18, because um, he started living with her when he was 18 years old. Um, and she was in school at the uh, Rockefeller University, which is a very fine medical school, scientific school in New York City. Um, so that's the set for the clip. I found this place on the Wall Street. And this is his first stable home, the first place he had a key to. Jean was about 18 and I was about 22. I never felt that he was my boyfriend, but we did have sex and we enjoyed each other's company on a lot of fronts. He was discovering his own art form. Having this apartment allowed him some possibility of working on that, developing it. The walls and floor were his canvas. In the living room, there was a turntable and his art. Yeah, I remember him fiddling. Obviously, I didn't, you know, it wasn't him with a brush and an easel. It was just him, like, crazy gluing something onto something else. Jean would be making art the way he'd be smoking pot. Alexis th took those photographs of Jean-Michel, which are all very precious. There aren't that many photographs of him at that age. And, um, and she's a wonderful photographer, and she's one of the leading embryologists in the United States. So um, we're going to ask Alexis a few questions, maybe in a little bit. But I wanted you to just expand on, on that, how this film took shape from um, that starting point of, of discovering Alexis's archive um, and how this became, I think you were starting off with making a short about, about it, how this became a feature film and how you sort of define the parameters of this film. It's, it's really interesting that you choose to focus on just um, a few years at a very particular uh, time in his life and in the life of uh, New York City. So, so can you talk about that decision? Yeah, actually, um I, you know, one of the things, what I, what I thought of when I saw what Alexis had, I thought, this is not only a window into him, this is a window into our city at that time. Um, between 78 and 81, um, New York City was a bombed out city. Nobody wanted to live there. And we had a very weird uh, kind of organic happening art community downtown. 
And part of it was because the city was so dangerous and so empty, and it was sort of our playground. Uh, there were no rules. There were no, uh, the police were just as afraid as everybody else. And um, I chose this period because it's the period right before Jean-Michel becomes famous. And it was the group of friends that he had uh, that he, after he became famous and was with gallerists, he sort of, he was in a different zone. It was a different world. And, um, and I found it so interesting that the people he chose to hang out with was like his own university. He was picking people like Luc Sant, who's an incredible writer. He was picking Alexis, who was being a scientist. He was picking, you know, Jim Jarmish. Um, and he was, pick, you know, he was picking people to, to, to learn from. He was absorbing information from all of these people. And he was a kind of, he, you know, there's the film Radiant Child. Well, he was very radiant from the inside out. He, and, and he was so curious about so many things and so many different art forms, too, and music. I wanted to hear you talk a bit about the, the process of, of um, just making this film, because what I really appreciated about it is how it, it strikes this balance between um, this portrait of a person and a portrait of a, of a community. I think it, it's, as a, as a biography, I think it, it really does bring um, Basquiat to life in a very vivid way, but also it brings his cultural context to life and it shows um, how that context shaped him and how he became in some ways like a very emblematic uh, sort of a face of that period. So, you know, was it a difficult balance? Because you, the film does take little tangents, you know, where you have people talking about graffiti, talking about hip hop, talking about the performance scene, the music scene, um, but then it, there's always Basquiat hovering over this whole thing. And, and it's interesting too that you, that you never actually hear him in the film. I mean, a lot of it is just, there's a lot of footage, very evocative footage, but um, it's not like he's, you know, he's there speaking as, as one might expect of a, a, a more conventional thing. Well, there's no around. audio of him yeah. at that time. Right. So, um, and I kind of wanted him to be a ghost. And, but I also was very interested because when I saw Alexis's collection up and started reading his writings and seeing everything, I started thinking about who he was and where, did, where he came from. And I knew where he came from, because I came from there too. And, all, and Jim came from there. And Alexa, we all came from the same environment. And I think it's so interesting to know where an artist came from, what fed them, what inspired them. And, and, and I take tangents because I started learning things about him. I started, you know, and about my city too, while making the film. And you know, I hadn't made a film in 24 years before Boom For Real. And I basically just went out, when I saw what Alexis had, I went out and I bought a camera and I just started shooting. And because I haven't been able to get financing because it's very difficult, uh, especially if you're not a conventional filmmaker. And, uh, and it was a great freedom to just go and, and start shooting and to have a tiny crew of three people. It was a wonderful way to work. So the process was finding people who you wanted to talk to, who thought you, you would, thought would bring something to this, but also, I guess, digging this sort of archaeological, like finding of archival, there's a lot of great archival material in the film. Is some of it stuff that you shot? I mean, there are clips, you mentioned Permanent Vacation, I think there's a clip from, I think and it's you there. And I, there's a clip. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of... Uh, well, I shot, I, I discovered, I totally forgot that I shot Max Roach and Fat by Freddy. Uh, Nan Golden, the photographer, had it, asked me to be her assistant for a Max Roach and Fat by Freddy shoot, and I brought my Super 8 camera and I shot them. And then I found that in my office while I was, and that's in the film, that material, um, because uh, Jean-Michel was a great lover of jazz, and Freddy's godfather was Max Roach. And Freddy is who brought bebop and jazz to Jean-Michel. Um, so, and, and, and it's also been, very interesting, so many artists that haven't been noticed for a long, you know, rediscovering artists that I knew from that period but hadn't really been in touch with or, you know, and, and I, f I feel again that our community from back then was so supportive. I feel like they all helped me make the film. It was a, because, you know, we didn't really have a lot of money and, and to have so much archival material without a lot of money is very difficult. So, 
think you have a, do you have a clip of Freddy picked out? Do yeah. You know, should we show that, maybe? Nothing about graffiti was celebrated. It was the scourge of the city at that time. It was hated. I mean, it was a blight to a great extent, but there was a lot of creative energy within that blight, which people didn't take the time to look at and examine. something developing here that's a real creative expressive form and Lee is just the Leonardo da Vinci of subway spray painting well over a hundred whole cars to paint one of those cars, you have to imagine, you know, you have eight, 10 hour window of time to be able to go to a place, you know, being very vulnerable for that. But the results the next day was fantastic. You know, when that train arrived, you felt like you arrived with it. Um, can you say a bit more about this idea of, uh, of Jean-Michel as a ghost and how that, you know, informed the way you put the film together, structure the film, because it's, it's defined, obviously, by both his presence and his absence. Well, I think also New York is a bit of a ghost. Yeah. That time, the city itself, that memory, and memories are like ghosts. And they're not always real or pure, or they're, but they're, they're somehow some emotionally grounded thing. Um, I felt like we didn't have in, in interviews or, you know, this was a period where he wasn't the focus of anything, really. We were all sort of, you know, filming each other and stuff. Um, so I, I, I just felt, and also I, I like ghosts and he is a ghost and I like ghost story movies. You've made ghost story movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was, uh, and I also wanted to, I wanted to make I wanted to make a very respectful portrait of him. I, I I felt that that was very important, and I kept it. There were you know there's there it was like a spider web. As soon as you go into the Jean Michel world, it starts spider webbing out, and I wanted to keep it contained within those years, within those people that were around him in those years. I mean I could have gone so many other places, and. Um, and I didn't, you know, we all know the story of him and his, you know, rise to fame and then his, you know, death, premature death. Uh, and th that story didn't need to be told, but I thought what needed to be told was just this specific time where he really was finding himself as the artist he became. Yeah. Um, this is not exactly your first documentary. You made a documentary short. Uh, in the 90s, I think it yeah. was in the 90s, about the Bowery, mm -hmm. also about a, you know, um, a vanished, vanishing place at the time, I think when it was on the cusp of major changes. Uh, and I'm wondering when you, know, when you work on fiction versus documentary, does it feel like a very different process for you? You've, you've just made some connections to your, your fiction work in terms of you know, this idea of, the, of ghosts. And, um, but I do think that your fictional work does have this um, very I think we've talked about this, this the dual, you know, it's, it's very, even if it's um, fantastical or surrealist, there's always a very strong uh, real, grounding in reality, um, even in your fictional works. Well, uh, there's something very freeing. The little movie that I made, it was for French television about the Bowery. They asked several filmmakers to make, it was called Post, a series called Postcards from New York. And they asked several filmmakers to, to do their favorite place in New York. And, you know, the Bowery is somewhere where I've witnessed and I've walked, you know, for years. And I had just come off of making When Pigs Fly, the ghost story movie, where, you know, I had had producers steal money from the budget. I had, like, this cumbersome crew. I couldn't, I found out my line producer was an alcoholic before I started shooting, and I couldn't fire her. And, you know, it was, uh, it, and so it was very freeing to just pick up a camera. I made the little Bowery movie with three kids or 18 years old, 19 years old kids. One was a kid who was supporting his mom by selling pot in the Bronx and wanted to be a cinematographer. So I just handed him the camera. 
And the film is very funky and kind of, you know, it's not technically great. And I've always been so technically uh, uh, concentrated on my, on my narrative films. It's like every frame, every, the way it's lit, everything, it, you know, the way the music, everything I control. Whereas this was like, I don't have to control anything. I'm gonna give this camera to the kids and then we're just gonna go spend some days out on the street. And it was great, you know, the three, of, the four of us made the film together. And then it was the same feeling with this. It was just very freeing to own my own camera. When we were a crew of four people, we had my camera, we had, uh, we had, I had a young professional cameraman, and then I had Tom Jarmish, who has shown films here, uh, uh, who was on like funky media, like early video and Super 8 and things like that. And, and a producer and a sound person. That was our crew. Should we show the next clip? But I knew that Sean was not one of the writers. He was never really a graffiti artist, you know? I mean, he was not part of the culture, you know? I mean, there was a, we, a way we dressed, the way, how we spoke. He wasn't part of that. Well, graffiti, I mean, anyone that's scribbling something on the wall becomes graffiti, you know, being black and writing words. He's tagged as a graffiti artist, but that was his canvas, you know? He didn't really have a place to live, so if he wanted to create something, he put it outside the wall, right? You talk about that point and like why you know wanting to make that point in the film. Not he's not a graffiti artist. Well, because people think of him as a graffiti artist. He was never a graffiti artist. He was a poet who wrote on walls, wrote words on walls. Um, I mean, it's funny. Even Diego called him, who was his first dealer, called him a graffiti artist, and that was just as a misnomer. The graffiti, like Lee Quinones. Uh, who's really master graffiti artist, I mean, he never thought of Jean as a group. You know, Jean was not making like his name beautiful on the sides or doing drawings on, on walls and things. He was writing words. He wanted, to, he wanted to let people know through words. Kind of like Bob Marley with the, the you know, of, of sending out a message through his words. And so it was different than graffiti. And, um, and graffiti, because it started on the trains, was a moving image. He was doing it on walls, you know. Someone also makes the point in the film that he was strategic about where he was doing it, right? right. In the proximity of the art world, like in Soho. Like, so that was also, I think, a different. Uh, a yeah, different he was approach. not naive. He was very ambitious. And I think that that complexity really comes across in the film. This combination of naivete and sophistication and ambition. I don't know if Alexis, you want to weigh it as somebody who knew him at the very start. I mean, but that seems to be like this interesting uh, duality. Yeah, he definitely was writing in lower Manhattan in the, and wanted to be seen by the art world, for sure, and be recognized. And we all saw his graffiti, I, I mean, his writing before we met him. But, yeah. And also, I have to say, Alex, only Alexis and one other person, Glenn O'Brien, are the only two that saved work of Jean Michel's from this period, uh, as far as I know. Everybody else just threw it out, or they thought it was garbage, because he would paint on any, he would draw on anything, and um, and they were the only two that had foresight. And you know, he was staying with a lot of people at different times. So you, um, the film premiered last fall, and you've been, you know, showing it around a, li a little bit now and um, I'm you know curious how your experiences have been with audiences in terms of how this film speaks to the present day um, I mean I like that the film doesn't exist simply as a, as a time capsule I think there's something about how it resonates today in terms of not just Basquiat's presence but the idea of what this time has come to represent you mentioned Carla McCormick's, you know, show. Um, MoMA has a show now um, as well um, on Club 57. You know, so I think there's this, this, the way in which this period um, in New York City's cultural life is being um, reassessed, uh, remembered. Um, you know, and you obviously were a very big, big part of that world. Um, well, I think that again, it's it's. You know, we have so many race issues going on. We have the whole drug thing going on in, uh, you know, in America. We have oxycotton. Something like one out of every four Americans is on oxycotton. That's a statistic I read recently. 
uh, which is a drug that doesn't need to exist, could disappear if the, we could get it off the market. Um, and it was the same with our community that um, you know drugs were socially acceptable. Heroin was very acceptable. Um, it killed a lot of people. Um, and it was a way of clearing out the Lower East Side so realtors could come in. This was during Reagan, right after 81. When, that's when people started dying. 81, 82, drugs were really flowing in. Um, so there are many parallels and like also the whole, you know, racism that's going on in our country and um, but I think most importantly for me is I really want young artists, young people to get off their iPhones, get out of cyberspace and start talking to each other and and I'm hoping that this film will inspire people to do that and I, I showed it at Miami Basel and there were a lot of young artists in the audience and they said they, they said well how do we become a community? And I said, well, you start an art fair. You start thinking of ways where you're going to be able to work together to, to create something that's going to cause an energy which is going to ignite. Um, and, um, and I think it's, I, it worries me. I think that's something that we've lost as humans. And, uh, and not that you know, this film's supposed to cure that or anything, but just as a small example of how if we unite and we work together, we can create something that can, that can have a ripple effect. I think the other thing that this, this time represents too is just the sense of um, a possibility that maybe doesn't exist today. And in the simple fact of just this, these overlapping worlds, you know, like how there was, as you, you said, there was just, everything was, was, was coming together, the boundaries were, were, were dissolving. And it seems like the, the walls between film and art and music and even within these disciplines you know that, that everything is much more like segmented and um, closed off um, and there just doesn't seem to be as much you know, cross pollination and they all need each other yeah they all the art for arts need each other you can't write a book unless you've gone to a gallery and seen a painting or seen or seen some you know visual things or a movie or you know everything informs you as an artist and this departmentalizing of the arts is really unfortunate. Um, I do want to leave some time for audience questions, so I will open it up in a bit, but uh, I want you to maybe spend a, just a little bit of time talking about the films that you're selected. Every time you do a carte blanche, I'm incredibly impressed with uh, this, the range of films that you've put together. Uh, I'm, you know, we just saw um, Alan Greenberg's um, Land of Look Behind, which is, uh, I think, quite, a, a revelation for a, a lot of pe people who have never seen it. Um, but I'm also curious about some of the other films you've put together and the idea of idiocracy as a documentary is also really interesting. <laughs> if you can expand on that. Um, idiocracy was released in 2006 during George Bush Jr.'s reign and um, uh, it was suppressed. It was released maybe, I don't even know if it was ever theatrically released, but it became known uh, there, it's sort of an underground movement for where people would get copies and be able to see it on DVD and stuff like that. But it basically very, and, then, and it's become very well known just from this circuit of word of mouth. And I remember seeing it in 2006, which predicted that America was gonna be, the president of America was gonna be a World Federation wrestler. And now we have the reality TV president. <laughs> and, so many things in that film are now parallel to what's happening now. And I was reading an article that uh, in Time Magazine about um, that right before Trump was elected that came out about idiocracy, saying it was predicting everything. And Mike Judd, the director, said, yeah, but that was supposed to be 490 years from now. And it's happening now. And I thought, well, idiocracy was made as a narrative, but now it is a documentary. And terrifying. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I know. I, I love that idiocracy is showing here. Um, but other, do you want to talk about? Do you want to maybe call out some other highlights, some rarities that you're showing? These a lot of these films are really quite difficult to find. So maybe and you want to recommend the a couple festival of to find. <laughs> so they did a great job. Yeah. Um, uh, Native Land is a film by Leo Hurwitz, Paul Strand, and Paul Robeson. 
It was made in 1942. It was the first social documentary ever made in America. Um, uh, Leo Hurwitz was later blacklisted as a communist and had difficult times in his, during his life. But Native Land I saw 30 years ago, and it, Paul Strand is one of the great photographers, and the photography in the film is just extraordinary. And it's about team bu uh, union busting, and it echoes everything that's happening now in, in America and throughout the world, the rise of fascism and nationalism. And um, again, it was like a prophetic type film. And at the end of the film, I, I, you know, he's, it, it's, uh, Paul Robeson says, fascism is cyclical and it will always rise again and we have to always be vigilant. And I think it's such an important message for now, and, but it's also an extraordinarily beautiful film visually to see and very powerful. Um, thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the festival. Thank you so much.